I now look to Simon Mundy to continue the case for the opposition. Good evening, and thank you for having me. One thing we really strive for at the Financial Times is to avoid groupthink. And I think Tom and I are demonstrating that very well this evening by lining up on opposing sides of this debate. And I should say, I strongly agree with many of the points that Tom and the other speakers for the proposition have made this evening. And I share many of their concerns about the model or models of capitalism that prevail in the world today. But when it comes to the specific question that we're debating this evening, I've come to the opposite conclusion from them. And I'll now try and explain why and how I've come to that conclusion in the hope that I might persuade you to join me in it. I've spent most of my career as a foreign correspondent, and that's given me an amazing opportunity to see for myself how the modern economy works in different places around the world. For four years of that time, I covered the Korean Peninsula, which of course has been the scene of a unique experiment in capitalism versus its opposite. I arrived in Seoul in the summer of 2012 and moved into a tiny little flat in a lively area called Gangnam a few weeks before the song Gangnam Style took the world by storm. This was a time when South Korea was really finding its stride and swagger, having propelled itself from one of the poorest countries in the world, which it really was in the 1950s, to one of the most prosperous in just a couple of generations. A short distance across the border in North Korea, people were enduring grinding poverty without political freedom, decent nutrition or healthcare or education or any of the basic modern rights that their counterparts in the South took for granted. Now, until the mid-1940s, Korea had been a single nation, fairly homogenous, both economically and culturally. But while South Korea's economic miracle was driven by its smart deployment of private markets, North Korea's appalling poverty stemmed directly from its government's attempts to stamp those things out. Now, North Korea is, of course, a uniquely terrible place. But it's just one of many case studies that show us that if a modern nation tries to eliminate the fundamental elements of capitalism, and that's just markets and private ownership of capital goods, it tends to end up with very damaging effects on human well-being, not only in material terms, but also in terms of basic liberties due to the political oppression that is needed to maintain these economically totalitarian systems. And since human well-being is what ethics is ultimately concerned with, the empirical evidence available to us suggests that capitalism, and that's simply a system that allows for some form of markets and private ownership of capital, seems to offer us our best shot at an ethical economic system, an ethical system of consumption and production. Now, more recently, I gained a rather different perspective on modern capitalism. When I spent two years traveling through 26 countries to research a book looking at responses to climate change around the world. And the deeper I dug into the climate crisis, the more profoundly I was confronted by the fact that while modern capitalism has transformed living standards for billions of people around the world, it's also come with some terrible side effects from residents of disappearing islands in the South Pacific to pastoralists in northeastern Ethiopia whose herds are being ravaged by drought and locust infestation. All over the world, I encountered vulnerable communities whose whole way of life was being ripped apart by the impacts of global warming. And one thing that these communities I just mentioned tend to have in common is that their own contribution to this crisis is minimal. Ethiopia's carbon emissions per capita are about 0.1 tons per year. In the US, it's 16 tons, 160 times higher. We have to be clear-eyed about the fact that the climate crisis is driven by consumption, and especially by the consumption habits of people like us, people who live in the wealthier countries. So having seen the suffering of the people that I just mentioned, I have serious concerns about the ethics of that consumption, including my own. And it's not just the climate crisis. 
we're constantly confronted with alarming revelations about the supply chains behind the products we consume, whether it's working conditions in factories or the local impacts of the extraction of basic resources. And then there's the distribution of the consumption, the fact that some of us get to do so much more of it than others. Now, these two contrasting perspectives seem to leave us with a quandary, don't they? On the one hand, capitalism appears to offer the best available framework for, living, for raising living standards on a large scale. On the other, the current version of capitalism is manifestly riven with dire flaws and injustices. So, what should we make of the question that has brought us all here tonight? Well, we first need to be very clear about what that question is. Because if the motion were, this house believes there is no ethical consumption under this version of capitalism, under the currently prevailing model of capitalism, well, you might well have found me on the other side of the debate. Because if you're engaging with the complex, globally interwoven system of capitalism that prevails today, then your consumption will, to some extent, be tainted by that system's fossil fuel foundations and by all the other problems that I alluded to earlier. But that is not the question that we're debating tonight. We're not debating whether there can be ethical consumption under this version of capitalism. The motion is couched in conceptual terms. It asks us to consider whether there is something inherent about capitalism that precludes ethical consumption. And I see no evidence that this is the case. There's nothing intrinsically unethical about markets and private ownership of capital. It all comes down to the way in which the wider system is designed and structured and regulated. So the answer is not to abolish markets, as we saw repeatedly in the 20th century. That doesn't end well. But all too often, communist disasters have been invoked to support a lazy, complacent embrace of the status quo. And that is emphatically not the answer either. In fact, one of the core problems in economic and political discourse today is the extent to which the basic concept of capitalism has been captured by the Gordon Geckos and Donald Trumps of the world, who have secured a widespread acceptance by many people from right across the political spectrum of this idea that capitalism must go hand in hand with things like extreme inequality, ecological degradation, and outsized economic rewards for a privileged few. And there's absolutely no reason why that has to be the case. Because while there are many blatant injustices within the current economic framework, these are not inherent features of a market economy per se, but rather failures of market design and regulation that we can and must address. Let's take carbon emissions as one example. Earlier, I alluded to a staggering global scale injustice under our current paradigm, whereby consumers and the businesses that serve them get to pump carbon into the atmosphere, imposing huge costs on vulnerable communities all over the world for free. But there is, of course, an answer to this, putting a serious pan-economy price on carbon that would force all economic actors to reckon with the full cost of their emissions and thereby dramatically accelerate the reduction of that pollution. The rapid decline of coal usage in the European power sector since the introduction of carbon pricing for that industry shows how effective the principle can be. We have a massive distance further to go here but by implementing a rigorously assessed carbon pricing system that applies across the entire economy with the proceeds deployed fairly and judiciously, we can destroy the incentive to trash the planet and tackle one of the most grievous ethical flaws in our existing system. The new system would still be a capitalist one, but a very different one from the model of capitalism we have today. The fundamental point here is that capitalism has always been a work in progress. The capitalist system in this country used to profit openly from the buying and selling of human beings and from small children working in dangerous factories. There has been progress over the years, and we can do so much better still. While today's economic model is still full of grave and glaring problems, it is absolutely possible to conceive of a truly ethical capitalism in which our consumption is aligned with our values. And the question is how we move towards it. All over the world, there are people working towards that goal in civil society, politics, whether they're academics or innovators or entrepreneurs. Each and every one of us has the opportunity to play a part in building a thriving economic system which allows for markets and private property rights, but eliminates the grievous injustices 
we see today. Or we can take the easier option of embracing the concept underpinning tonight's motion, resigning ourselves to the bleak notion that we live within an economic system that is, at its core, irredeemably immoral, and thereby duck out of the greatest challenge of our time. I urge you instead to cast your vote tonight on the side of hope, on the side of collective ambition for what modern civilization can achieve, and to vote against the motion this evening. Thank you.